everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Ana Cavalcante and I'm a student assistant with Bob Graham Center for Public Service and your host for this program in partnership with our friends in the Beyond 120 program. So before we kick this off, I just want to go over tonight's agenda and some quick Zoom housekeeping. Uh, we will first hear from each of our panelists and then go into Q&A. I would like to ask all of us to keep our mics muted unless you're speaking and to e use either the chat feature or the raise your hand function to ask questions. Feel free to send your questions to the general chat or directly to me. If you would like to speak, just you know, do the little raise your hand emoji and um, we'll you know, go in order of that. We will be recording the session and it will be sent out tomorrow and posted to the Graham Center website. And without further ado, um, I'm going to welcome, uh, introduce our panelists, and then we'll get started. So we are pleased to host three UF and Graham Center alums to speak with us about their careers in public service in the public health and science sectors. Our panel includes Chris Batista, co-founder and president of Florida Community Innovation, Caroline Nickerson, also a co-founder of Florida Community Innovation, and a senior program manager for SciStarter, and Maya Pundwani, communications associate of the United Nations uh, shot, shot at life, United Nations Foundation Shot at Life campaign. So please join me in the virtual welcome to Chris, Caroline, and Maya. So we'll start off with Chris, and then we'll go around the circle and go into Q&A. So again, while they're speaking, feel free to put in your questions in the chat feature. So Chris, go ahead, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the welcome, Hannah. Um, and thanks for being here, everyone. Um, very excited to to chat with you today about um, two topics very close to I think all of our hearts here, public service and, and science. Um, as I understand it, I'm supposed to be the science end of this and uh, maybe maybe more, more public service from the others, I don't know, <laughs> but um, uh, I guess I'll get started with my, uh, my background at the, the Graham Center and uh, maybe kind of start the story when I was perhaps in, in your shoes at UF and then um, the crazy, crazy adventure that's happened since in case that is helpful to anyone. So um, I graduated UF in 2019, got involved with the Graham Center my junior year. I was an engineer, mechanical engineering major. So um, I had no idea what the Graham Center was until my uh, pre-law roommate was like, man, you gotta come to this thing. This is awesome, cool people, public service, and there's pizza. And I was like, all right, I'll come. So <laughs> um, ended up getting really involved and did the fellows and FOF. Um, the year that I was involved, FOF's topic was technology in, in, in government, which has continued to be a theme of my career. So um, definitely some really formative experiences there. If anyone here that's considering joining the fellows or serving on the, the FOF organizing committee, I would definitely recommend um, that experience. Uh, after graduation, I decided that um, trying to solve big picture problems in Washington sounded more fun than um, trying to specify uh, bolts and material properties as a as a mechanical engineer. So I moved to Washington, D.C., um, took a job at a big consulting firm and started um, working within the government, advising on, on scientific issues. Um, I had a lot of fun there, saw a lot of the inside of how the government work, another experience I recommend, and also learned that as an entry level person in Washington, you're still specking screws and material properties, just, just a little bit different, a uh, little bit different type of um, detail orientation in, in Washington versus, versus engineering. So um, eventually quit to start my own firm um, and kind of work on what I wanted to work on. And this was around the time that I um, um, started to hear about COVID. Um, this was kind of an emerging uh, threat abroad and sitting in, 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 in Washington, I was like, oh no, this is, this is coming. Um, we gotta do something about this, especially for Florida. Um, so Caroline and Maya and a bunch of our, uh, honestly, Graham Center alums and friends um, ended up um, founding a nonprofit with the initial goal of trying to, to fight um, the wave of COVID um, through public education um, and influence campaigns. And so we had a lot of fun trying to convince people to wear their masks, which I think Florida is kind of famous for that being a difficult challenge in our, in our state for better or worse. Um, so we managed to reach something like a quarter million people with our efforts. We built out some really cool web technology and we're now um, 
dedicated to the broader goal of improving public health through getting um, underrepresented communities more involved in the technology industry, uh, providing training opportunities to anyone who's sort of interested and motivated to become an engineer or a product manager or data scientist and ensuring those opportunities are a little bit more evenly distributed. So we've had a lot of fun. Um, I've talked for way too long already. I said to Caroline, how am I gonna talk for five minutes about myself, but I managed to do it somehow. Um, so I think for the rest of the, the session, if you're interested in, in the angle of how does how do science and public service play together, um, I think those questions are very welcome on my end. If you're interested in entrepreneurship and um, how that can happen even within highly regulated and kind of traditionally bureaucratic spaces. Um, I've banged my head against the wall a lot of times there and found a few places where I could break through. So um, lots of lots of opportunity, I think, to, 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 to do that, um, even in the public sector. Um, and then finally, if you're trying to figure out what the heck to, to do after graduating, I was in the same boat. So happy to, uh, happy to um, shoot the breeze on that as well. But I'll hand it off to, to Caroline and, and Maya at this point. Um, thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah, and Chris, I think that's such a good point you just made about um, entrepreneurship and traditionally bureaucratic spaces. Um, I know for many of you, I see some of you are current students, some of you are recent grads, maybe some of you are further along in your careers. Um, you can do public service, at, um, and you don't have to be a formal, you know, USA jobs searcher, government employee. Um, a lot of what I do, the work I do with federal agencies, it's through my work at SciStarter. We get federal grants, or we get a service contract from someone like NASA, and we're still able to serve the public through those projects, but um, we don't have the traditional constraints of, um, you know, wor working in the government is a, a really great goal, and I'll I'll probably do it someday uh, later on in my career, potentially, um, um, yeah, at the very least as a consultant. Um, but I think you can, there are so many different career paths in public service, especially in the intersection between science and public health and all those different spheres. So the future is really, really bright for all of you. Um, so my name is Caroline Nickerson. When I was at the University of Florida, I majored in history and Chinese language. Um, so East Asian languages and literatures with a focus on Chinese. Um, but I used to joke that I majored in Graham Center because I was involved and a co-founder of the Student Fellows. Um, I was um, involved with the Future of Florida Summit from the very beginning. Um, actually, the person who started the Future of Florida Summit, Natalie Martinez um, Varela, she and I started the Commission on Local Debates together. So the Graham Center, for those of you who are current students, it's a great place to make lifelong friends who you can come up with cool ideas with and make a different, a positive difference with for forever. Um, but Natalie did the Future of Florida Summit. And for those of you who are recent grads or who are further along in your careers, I would definitely still get on that Graham Center mailing list because you can come to events like this and still make connections that way. So that's my plug there. By the Future of Florida Summit, which is a conference, um, which is actually where I met Chris. Um, I did Civic Scholars. Um, I was a Ruben Askew scholar. I also received a grant um, from the Gramson there with another group of friends to have a living classroom at a local elementary school um, where students were able to grow their own food and cook it. And we did some science education there. Um, so I wasn't interested in science initially. As you can see, I didn't study science as an undergrad, um, but I got into it in part because of my different Gramson there opportunities. And I was really interested in technology. Um, and then, so after I graduated from UF, um, and I am a proud class skater, so I know a lot of you are College of Liberal Arts and Science students, so shout out to you. Um, I think uh, what you hear about a liberal arts education, the interdisciplinary nature of it, I've really tried to live it. So it's not all talk. Uh, those skills that you learn in class, you can take anywhere and everywhere all around the world. Um, after I graduated from UF, I um, initially was going to go to graduate school but I had some personal issues that prevented me from applying my senior year. Um, so I had to regroup a little bit. And I wanted to let you all know it's not, you're hearing my highlight reel. Um, it's not a linear path necessarily, but I am so grateful that I did take that gap year because I worked at the University of Florida Department of Psychiatry doing textbook and curriculum development to benefit homeless and underserved individuals. Um, so that's something that meant a lot to me. Um, I still volunteer with them. 
I um, work with the USDA um, bioethics unit through them. Um, so I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that, for that. And I'm really glad that I had that unexpected gap year. Um, but after my gap year working at UF Psychiatry, I went to um, American University in DC where I received my MPP, my Master of Public Policy degree, um, and where I also, um, for a brief period, um, did some work at the um, DC Mayor's Office, the Executive Office of the City Administrator, um, in their uh, policy lab. And I didn't stay there for too, too long. It was just a um, one semester assistantship through my university. I started working at SciStarter. I kind of uh, worked, I volunteered my way into a job at SciStarter because initially I was just blogging and then I started getting more and more responsibilities. And then all of a sudden I'm managing all these different programs. I still work at SciStarter today. That's my full-time job now. Um, I manage um, the protect the, um, become a citizen scientist to protect the planet program for Verizon. I work with um, NOAA um, and a number of um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association um, and a number of science centers and museums on um, programs where volunteers are able to monitor um, climate impacts and environmental impacts. I um, manage the Girl Scouts journey where Girl Scouts are able to get a badge for doing citizen science um, and a bunch of other things. Uh, there are quite a few different programs to do at SciStarter, no two days are the same. Um, but you might be wondering, what is citizen science? Citizen science is public engagement in real scientific research. That could be water quality monitoring. That could be playing a video game to accelerate the search for a cure to Alzheimer's disease. And citizen science isn't necessarily overlapping with um, you know, public service and uh, with policy, but I think they're, they're very complementary. And a lot of the projects I work on get to connect the two. When you're working with a community so they can understand their environment. Um, or they could document what's going on with their water. Or if you're, um, you know, I, I think accelerating the search for a cure to Alzheimer's is a public service we can all get behind. Um, and many projects are run by federal agencies, are um, different governments worldwide. Um, so there are so many different ways a member of the public can meaningfully become meaningfully involved with science. That being said, there are some projects where people are just swabbing their belly buttons for microbes. And that's just kind of a, a fun project. Uh, because we're all curious, right? We all love learning about the world around us. Um, but there are many projects that I think um, have clear public um, imperatives and are really, really important. So if you go to SciStarter, you can find a project that works for you and you can become a citizen scientist no matter how old you are. I work with everyone from Girl Scouts to retirees. So it's, um, I would definitely go ahead and get started there. Uh, that being said, um, for fun, I get to work with Chris, and um, I've worked with Maya on this too when we started FAIR, as Chris was talking about. We, it was originally the Florida Alliance for Response to Epidemics, but we jokingly started calling it the Florida Alliance to Respond to Everything. So we ended up um, kind of adapting it and changing the name to Florida Community Innovation, which you'll see on my Zoom background. Um, and uh, we still have all, all the material from FAIR up there, those public education campaigns that Maya and Chris and I and all of our friends work together on. But also with FCI, Florida Community Innovation, there's a resource map that you can explore that we've collaborated with the Central Florida Foundation and the United Way of Northwest Florida to produce to connect people to the resources they need, be those food banks, be those COVID tests, or um, any other resource that is showcased by those organizations. And that map, we are redesigning it, we are honing it. So if you have feedback, don't be shy about letting us know. Um, so in terms of, so as you can see, I, I've done a few different things. I also, I do pageants for fun. So I was Miss Louisiana Earth and I was the, the grand prize scholarship winner this year at Miss Earth USA. Um, and I actually use that as a tool for public service and science because I was able to make my platform all about citizen science, resiliency, and um, understanding the environment around you and making a difference in your community. So there, there's no right way and no wrong way to engage with the public. Um, so I, that being said, I'm just so grateful for the ties the Graham Center gave me. Um, I'm grateful for everything that I learned, for the legacy that undergirds the Graham Center. I really, for those of you who aren't actively involved, one way I actively got involved is I just started showing up in Q Hall and all the material opportunities kind of materialized from there. And I think the greatest reward of that is the friendships. Um, so working with Chris and working with Maya um, is really a privilege. So Did she freeze or is that just me? I think she froze. I think so. So we'll wait until she's back. Um, Maya, do you wanna go ahead? 
Sure. So my name is Maya Punjwani and I'm from Miami, Florida, but I'll be moving to DC soon for work. And I graduated last spring and I didn't. So I studied journalism and then I minored in public health and I wasn't really sure where in communications and journalism I wanted to work right after school. But then with the pandemic, I knew that it would be a good time to lean in to public health and there was a lot of opportunity in that space. So after my graduation, I interned remotely for the summer at the United Nations Foundation in their global health communications, which I actually saw in a Graham Center newsletter. So definitely subscribe to those because I owe so much to it. But after that, I worked on the Biden for President Advance team for a little bit. And then I started my full-time job at the United Nations Foundation in their shot at life at vaccine advocacy campaign. And I'm a communications associate. And basically we advocate for global childhood vaccines through organizations like UNICEF, WHO um, on Capitol Hill. And then, so what I do specifically is I help with the communications that we do with the public, whether that be through social media or our corporate partners like Walgreens, and then also with our grassroots advocates that lobby on the hill for vaccine access and while i was in college i was really involved with the graham center I, th I thought that was so funny what caroline said about majoring in the graham center so i can go a little bit into my experience there but other than that i interned at the new york city mayor's office of correspondence and i also owe that um to my mentors at the graham center who helps me get there like dr d and others and also marianne spoke with me when i was looking into all of that and then i also interned for michelle obama at the personal office of the obamas which caroline had sent me the posting to that so honestly the graham center has just helped me so much throughout my career path and i was a student fellow since my freshman year and then i became the director of special projects and in that position, I was able to host our first campus conversations event, which I know we've had some afterward, even after I graduated at the center. And I basically I had represented the Graham Center at the Harvard Kennedy School at a politics conference. And after that, I thought it would be a good idea to bring an event on campus that helped promote dialogue among students about hot topic issues at the time. So we did. Uh, we did an event discussing mental health resources and free speech zones on campus, and I believe it was gun safety was the other one, but that was a really good event that I was able to collaborate with other students and also administrators, and I've definitely spoken about it in interviews, and then also I helped write for the Let's Talk Gainesville magazine on local issues, and Chris and I had written something together about science which was published in the Gainesville Sun and we later turned this into a podcast so uh, I helped with another Graham Center alum host an episode on mental health and then we both started our own podcast just about graduating and being in our 20s and post-grad life so we definitely got our feet wet with the Graham Center and the Let's Talk Gainesville podcast so that was a really cool opportunity. Another thing that I did with the Graham Center was I helped host a human trafficking symposium and I really enjoyed that and I didn't even really know much about human trafficking before that so when I was home one summer in Miami I got involved with a local nonprofit that deals with human trafficking and anti-domestic violence called No More Tears so I don't even know if I would have been interested in that if it wasn't for the Graham Center so lots of props to the Graham Center for everything and then my last year I attended the I attended the Future of Florida Summit and that was a really great experience as well but yeah, overall, um, I have really enjoyed all of these panels. I know Jerry Bruno was in the last one talking about the New York City Urban Fellows Program, and that was something that I had applied to after graduating, but with COVID, it didn't really work out. But definitely, I, I think we'll get into advice in the Q&A, but I really encourage everyone to take advantage of the newsletter and also join organizations if you can. I know it might've been a little tough this past year with the pandemic, but as things are opening up in person, just try to get involved because I think that those experiences in the long run helped me a lot more than what I was learning in the classroom and just gave me more to talk about in interviews and in networking and things like that. And then 
apply to every opportunity, even if you think you might not get it. Caroline had sent me that posting that the Obamas wanted interns and you just needed to send your cover letter. And it was a long shot, but somehow they picked me. And then they even had some another girl from UF the following semester. So it's not impossible. And then also message people on LinkedIn who have jobs that you're interested in because I messaged Mia, who works at the United Nations Foundation and was a Graham Center alum, and she was able to connect me and help me get in, and that was just an invaluable relationship. I never met her in person, but through the newsletter and everything, I was able to do that. And also my last little tip I'll give is just when you are doing interviews for different things, I suggest that you have a lot of good questions prepared You're on your own, just because I found that a lot of my interviews, including the one for the job I had, it was a few questions that they asked me. And then the rest of the time was they wanted to get a feel of how interested you were. And it was just like, ask us all the questions that you have. So yeah, those are a few of my things and happy to open it up to the Q&A. And Maya, really quick, that's such a good point about the interviews. I, my big tip is never ask a question in an interview that you could Google. Like ask like an actual real question. Um, one example I always use is Lindsay Casasus, who's another Graham Center alum. When she was interviewing for Brookings, the question, because at the end of the interview, I'm sorry for the thunder, everybody. Uh, at the end of an interview, they always ask like, do you have any questions for us? Ask something that you can't find on the internet. Like she asked like, how often do your research divisions interact with your social media um, divisions? To, you know tell your story and um spread the word about the work you're doing in a meaningful way um so that's a question that she couldn't find on the internet so i think that's a really good tip there and also everyone should follow maya's podcast i was a guest on it um for the um gen z versus millennial debate and maya who would you say won for the gen z's versus the millennials i think it ended up being more of a discussion than a debate which was nice you guys found a lot of common ground but yeah on Uncharted 20 is the podcast that I have. We also interviewed Kale McCall, who is a former Graham Center alum, and he talked all about cover letters, interview tips, and setting yourself up for professional success. So yeah, we love having Graham Center people on. Thank you all so much. Um, Caroline, I'm sorry you got cut off. Would you like to finish up, say anything else? No, I was People. trying to say I'm passing the mic to Maya, so I got cut off at like the perfect time. <laughs> well, that's good then. Um, thank you for those tips as well. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to you know put them into the chat or use the raise your hand function. Um, and once, if you are going to use the raise your hand, we do ask that you turn on your camera if possible, um, just so it makes it a little bit more personable. Uh, while people are coming up with their questions, I can get us started. And I guess you guys kind of touched a little bit there on tips, but um, what skills or qualities uh, are you looking for in a job applicant and what sets them apart from others? So kind of this could be from your perspective as you as an applicant or what you experienced and the feedback maybe you got once you were hired, or if you have been a position, a hiring position, what have you looked for? I think and Maya should take this first because um, Maya, I know that you were looking at internship applications recently at Thought of Life. Sure, yeah, we just hired some interns. We had a lot of positions posted and something that kept coming up was just being a good communicator and showing initiative and interest. So you, we were really surprised about how many people didn't follow up with the thank you after an interview, which I think that's just a not a red flag, but you just think, oh, is this person going to be a good communicator with our advocates and our partners if they don't even, you know, follow up? So that's something to keep in mind, like a basic thing, but do your research on wherever you're applying and definitely, for example, when I was up, when I was interviewing for my internship, I looked up, googled my interviewer, saw she was featured on a podcast talking about the a COVID-19 response fund that they were working on at the time. And so I asked her questions about that and it just shows your interest. And I would say, I guess, don't be too nervous. Like just, it's just a conversation. And at the end of the day, you're you're a great applicant. I mean, if you're involved with the Grimm Center, there's so many little anecdotes to talk about. You can practice different scenarios, like practice questions that are like, a time you worked together on a team, a time that you had to work on a project on a tight deadline, um, times that you were a good communicator or writer. Um, writing is really important, which I'm really grateful for my journalism background in that. And also just meeting deadlines and 
yeah, those are just some of my tips. Yeah, college and liberal arts and science skaters, um, you have an edge on the writing department. So definitely leverage that, like uh, mention those communication skills. And then um, Chris, I know you're, I would say you're really good at job interviews. Um, when you get in those job interviews context where you have to like do a task for people, maybe you could give people advice about that. Cause I see that becoming like increasingly common. Yeah, I did one of those last week. Um, sure, I don't know if being good at job interviews is a, is a my favorite skill, um, but it's a certainly a necessary one. Um, I was thinking through this from the perspective of when I'm trying to bring someone on to an organization I'm running, so I'll answer both your question and from that perspective. Um, I think it's probably the same answer for both. Um, what I'm looking for when I'm trying to hire a subcontractor or evaluate someone to see if they're a good fit for a um, nonprofit team and what I try to um, present when I'm completing homework assignments and in interviews um, are a couple things. I think the first kind of baseline question is like, do you either have the skills you need for the job or can you learn them within a period that's reasonable? So, um, showcasing your skills and honestly thinking ahead a few semesters um, so that you have time to convincingly train in the skills that are gonna get you hired, I think is probably one of the most important things. Um, if this is a mostly um, like lib arts and sciences crowd and you're interested in kind of policy and communications jobs, then maybe like more on the policy side, you might be able to do something quantitative, build up a portfolio piece where you're doing stats or something like that or if you're on communication side maybe you can do some creative work and demonstrate your portfolio of works so you can come in confidently and be convincing that you know your stuff from the skills perspective um something that i i thought through last time i worked on one of these assignments um that would be my second point is um to, to echo maya it's 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 also how, what are your soft skills, which is a super loaded and overused term, but like, what is, what are your communication and uh, emotional intelligence sort of capabilities that you're demonstrating both through your written work and the way you interact with the interviewers? Um, I would say most um, sort of re really desirable jobs that I, at least I've interviewed for or I've pursued have required both of those sides. You have to have the skills, but to kind of close the deal, you have to be able to build rapport with um, the organization and demonstrate good judgment, uh, especially if you're in a policy or client facing position. Um, you know, thinking about my consulting firm, if I'm, look, if I'm looking at two folks and one of them uh, demonstrates excellent judgment and composure around me, you know, and 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 um, just general considerateness and 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 ability to work with people. I'm going to be much more likely to want to put that person on my team in front of my client or lawmaker or whoever. And um, that's that's a skill that can can be learned. That's not like you know some sort of magical. It shouldn't be some sort of magical mist or something that one person has and one person doesn't. It's um, it, it's really mostly about listening and trying to understand where um, the other person is coming from and then, and then uh, being responsive and figuring out how you can work together to help. If you kind of bring that attitude to an interview, um, that can be really helpful. Um, and then the last thing I would touch on is just interest. Um, you know, companies and, 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 and uh, academia academia and, and um, even public sector areas are looking for folks that are interested in what they're doing, like genuinely interested in it, um, because those people are gonna stick around for longer, um, you know, put more of themselves into the work and produce better results in a lot of cases than someone that is disengaged or doesn't really, um, isn't where they wanna be. So like, I never wanna like hire someone into a position where they don't wanna be there. They don't feel like they're growing from the work. So, um, if you are really interested in the topic and, um, you know, you have, you have prior readings, a lot, of, a lot of students are sitting on, I've read all of this stuff about this topic because I love it. And then that never shows through in the interview because you focus narrowly on the question. So if you can find a way to 
demonstrate your interest and your background in the topic. And that goes back to thinking ahead a few semesters and building up that interest and background. Then that's super convincing um, to, to a hiring manager because they're like, wow, this person really knows their stuff and they're interested in it. And I'm gonna learn from them. Uh, you know, most, most people in management positions are relying on, <laughs> on their, their junior staff to know a lot of the substance. And so if you can show up and, and prove that you can provide that by what you already know, that's another huge foot in the door. So that's super long answer, but I, I hope that's maybe helpful. It's, it's a process. Interviewing is just a process and you can be learned and it can be prepared for it. It's not this scary thing that happens at the end of the semester and you roll the dice and if you're, you know, my hair is always messed up. It's not like if you roll into the interview and your hair is messed up, then like you don't get a job. I feel like that's kind of how I thought about it <laughs> as a student. It was high stress, um, but it's it's definitely something you can prepare for and and um, you know leverage leverage your skills that you already have to to your advantage. I think messy hair is kind of the norm in science fields uh, these days, based on the people I work with. Uh, one really quick thought on the subject of like entry entering the workforce or like applying for internships um you can make a positive difference in pretty much any job i was initially hired at the psychiatry department at uf to answer the phones um and it ultimately became a textbook and curriculum development position so no matter what your role is um or what your job description is like i promise you you can find a way to brighten people's days and do good things there um, and then I also, my big piece of advice too, for people, especially if you're entering like science and public health fields, um, and, then, and you might be doing things that you didn't necessarily study in school, um, try up front to negotiate for learning time on the job. Um, so ask them if they're gonna like pay for you to get additional certifications or to learn a new language for data analysis or things like that. I know for my job, um, I'm able to go back and get my PhD at the University of Florida in agricultural education and communication. And that's something that my job's really excited about. And they're gonna write me into different grants um, and support my research there. Um, and I was able to do that because I was um, very clear with them about my goals and I communicated with them along the way. So um, you all have such bright futures. I'm excited to see. And also for all of you in like the extended Graham Center network, like don't be shy about getting in touch with us. Like I'm more than happy to jump on a Zoom call or talk to you about your interests. Um, I know Maya, Chris and I, we all proofread each other's cover letters and things. Um, so this is definitely a community too. Yeah, Thank I would all. say my personal network at school was instrumental, sorry. <laughs> I, cut you off there. I was just gonna second that and say Maya and Caroline and other folks I've met at the Graham Center, you know, um, have been instrumental. So don't, don't feel like it's also a solo journey or a competitive thing, you know, ideally you want to get your team in your corner. And um, I can remember too many times it was, um, you know, the last hour before the application or grad school app was due and um, some friend in another time zone was up late, like, okay, yes, I'll do one more edit on your cover letter. <laughs> so that, that stuff matters, that shows the long run. So um, it's, easy, it's easier with friends, I think. So, so definitely, uh, definitely build your, your network while you're at school. And, I definitely agree with that. Thank you, all three of you, for that answer. And um, Chris, I do that as well. Caroline sending out cover letters and resumes to friends that I also made through the Graham Center. Uh, so our next question is from Gus. Gus raised his hand. So feel free, Gus, to meet yourself and ask your question. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I have a question specifically for, for, for Chris. Um, as someone, for example, I really want to get into data analysis, but I don't have as much experience as, for example, a computer science major or someone who majors in statistics. So what would you say would make a strong applicant in, in order to break into that industry, yet, despite having uh, a disadvantage in, in terms of course load, in terms of experience with different languages and stuff? Yeah, Gus, thank you for that question. That's a really good one and, and, and kind of fun to answer. I'm also a person with interests all over the place. Um, I kind of made the opposite transition, you know, coming from a very technical background into more strategy and, and policy. It can be done. So I, if, it's, if it's encouraging um, to, to hear this, when I was at um, a big four consulting firm working in the State Department, we had a, a data science group that was uh, almost 100 people and I would say probably like 30 of those people had formal computer science or statistics backgrounds. 
my boss was a uh, political science PhD who had finished in his PhD in England and um, was just really interested in data analysis and taught himself. So I think um, data science and the software engineering field more broadly is one that you can break into. As to your question, which is how, um, I think there's, there's two answers here. So um, the first one kind of echoing my previous thought is um, you do need like a, a foundational baseline of technical skills. Um, I think when you get into like a real um, environment, like at, at the data shop at the State Department, for example, no one knew everything. Um, I got in there and I didn't know some basic statistical functions that people were, you know, taught me on the job. And, and I had had a multi-year career as a software engineer before that. So um, you definitely in like a real work environment, it's, it's networked. So you don't have to know everything. Your peers are going to help you. But it's more of like, can you contribute to that environment when you get in the door? Do you know the basic? So um, I'm a big proponent of project-based learning. And I think this works well for the recruiting cycle. So um, there are some basic like Python and R courses that you can do to get a baseline and get the basic foundations. I think you could complete those alongside regular coursework within a few, week, few months or, or a semester, you could get some baseline under your belt. And then at that point, it's just what problem do you wanna solve? And so this gets into the second big point of, of this answer, which is you can leverage your unique experience that someone like me doesn't have um, in this field. So if you and I both walked into the State Department you know, interview, um, you would have a ton of like political science and writing. And um, I, don't, I don't know if you mentioned your, your major, but you have a lot of, a, a lot of um, social sciences um, and honestly, probably bigger picture, <laughs> you know, knowledge that a, an engineer isn't necessarily going to be be educated on an undergrad. So after you build that baseline of like, okay, I can write a for loop, I can, you know, I know what, you know, univariate analysis is, you know, then it's like, how do I set myself apart with what I, what, what, what my competitive advantage is. So if you're, if you're interested in something, if you're interested in say, you know, international migration patterns or something because you're a geography major and that was your minor, then do a data project on that topic, like find government data sources or find existing open source stuff, do a project that shows um, migration patterns in a new way, come up with a new graphic and write a notebook, um, you know, walk the reader through all the thought process that you took and be prepared to talk about that in an interview. And if you can layer together that, what, what we, what, you know, industry calls domain knowledge, um, which is what, what you're studying and what you have work experience in with enough technical knowledge, then you actually become an even more attractive candidate than someone who just has deep technical knowledge. Did that answer your question? It was a bit general. Feel free to follow up if <laughs> I can answer something more specific. No, I, I definitely think you answered it and you got the political science um, thing correct. So, so I guess I do give that vibe, uh, but yeah, thank you. I, I definitely appreciate that. You might yeah, want to consider course. applying for an MPP as well, um, like a master of public policy degree, because um, you take a lot of stats classes in that, and you can also use your poli sci knowledge as an asset. <laughs> yeah, and um, Gus and also anyone else with like data science questions, et, et cetera, if we don't get to it on, on this um, chat, you can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, online somewhere and we can, we can talk and can answer more detailed questions. Thank you so much. You go to floridainnovation.org and you can find Chris's email there in addition to information about FCI. Perfect. Uh, we'll probably send that link out in the chat as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Our next question is from Corey. Um, I see your hand is up, so feel free to unmute. And if you can turn your camera, go ahead. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. So um, I actually had a couple questions, so that's okay. Um, thank you all for your time. Um, you all have been amazing. Um, I first had a question specifically for Maya, um, if you don't mind. Um, so I have a little bit more of a, um, so what stuck out at first that you mentioned that you got the minor in public health. Uh, I am currently getting my master's in public health. And so when you mentioned your um, experience with the UN Foundation, like that really piqued my, piqued my interest. Um, and I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on opportunities um, 
that you saw through there or that you found interesting that you thought might be relevant? Sure, do you mean like different, the different campaigns they have or jobs or? Yeah, like campaigns, internships, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, I can send the career opportunities website. They still have a lot of things open right now, but essentially the UN Foundation works on a lot of health topics. Like they have the global health department, which I was in, and then many like campaigns. So there's one that focuses on malaria. We focus on vaccines. There's like climate team, there's gender equality. So a lot of the topics at the end of the day end up intersecting with health which is really interesting and kind of when I got the public health minor at UF it wasn't as sciencey it was more social science um, which I liked I remember there was one class that we did that was basically debating different public health topics that you wouldn't expect to be public health related um, and I'm trying, oh, it's called critical issues in public health. And the first week I remember we debated about vaccines and it's really funny that I'm working in it now because I never really would have thought I was going to, but yeah, the United Nations Foundation, it supports the United Nations. And so different, like for example, the World Health Organization, I believe they just established a foundation to help support them. So it's, it's a really cool place. We also have UNA USA, which is a campaign that is basically um, focusing on youth involvement with the UN. So if anyone is looking into opportunities to get involved on your college campus, I suggest looking at UNA USA as well. And yeah, I'll send the link now too. Maya, isn't there that youth, UN Youth Advocate? Is that still open? That just closed, but that was through UNA USA where you speak on behalf of the UN at different events and um, conferences and things like that. That's super neat. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Corey, I know you mentioned you have more questions, but let's go to Arturo and then we can come back to you. Perfect. That's good. So Arturo, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask your question. Hello. So my question, I guess, is directed towards uh, uh, Maya because she was she got a public health minor if I'm if I'm correct. Uh, yeah, so I am pursuing a bachelor's in the social sciences, but I have a minor in public health and I wanna pursue that as a career. So I guess my question is, and I'm not sure if the other panelists can also help answer this is, uh, so my concern is like, because I won't have the public health degree, I'm, I'm not sure how I can go about starting in the public health sector right after undergrad. So I just want to see if you had any advice or tips about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So even though you think that you have a you don't have a leg up since it wasn't like your main focus, just the fact that you were involved with it at all, I think is super helpful. For example, my cousin, she worked at the New York City Department of Health and she had no public health background whatsoever and that was she thought it was kind of a disadvantage but if, if even if it's just your minor just to show that you had some interest even if you're not studying it at school I know UF's public health college has like a global health case competition that I took part in and just you could be any major to do some type of involvement so that way you have something to talk about when you're applying to these things but you can always get certifications outside of school on the side. I always see those pop up on my LinkedIn and just try to get involved in any way you can so you have some thing to talk about. But I don't think that being a communications major like even hurt me at all with applying to public health positions just because I showed how interested I was. I didn't, I, I created three separate resumes when I was graduating. So one was communications focused, one was health focused with like anything I'd ever done related to health which included like Graham Center working on the podcast. I was like, oh, one of our episodes was about mental health. And then I had another like politics po um, focused resume. So that's just, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but just try to capitalize on what you have done and don't be discouraged if you think that you like chose the wrong major, chose the wrong minor for a lot of fields, especially public service related. It doesn't really matter what you graduated with. The intern we just hired at Shot at Life on my team was an architecture student and she's working on comms and public health, which I'm working on, so. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, Corey, if you want to ask your next question, go ahead. Thank you. This one's targeted a little bit more at um, Caroline, because you mentioned this like just offhand, like right towards the end of the beginning of the questions um, about negotiating on education in an interview. And like, I've never heard of that before and sounds like something that would be really helpful. So like practically speaking, like what does that look like in an interview? Yeah, um, I think it's one of those hit. So I came about it through the school of hard knocks. Um, I had a few jobs where they expected me to do a lot of unpaid like self-education outside of work. I think that's okay some of the time if it's a skill you really want to learn and it's good for your own personal development. Uh, but you also have to be good to yourself and be healthy. Um, and it's really good to just upfront say, um, you know, I'm interested in these particular fields. I already have this experience, but I'd really like to deepen it. Would I be able to take um, paid time off uh, to get the certification? Um, would you be willing to pay my tuition for this and that course? Um, you, you kind of have to feel them out and um, see where they're at. But it's also something you can do, like, let's say you're offered a lower salary band than you expected for a given position. Um, that's something you can say, um, you know, you can say like, okay, I'll take this offer contention on the fact that you support me to get these particular skills. Um, I think every negotiation is different. Um, and I think that especially, you know, when you're a woman in STEM or a woman in public health, you are like, I mean, it's just a fact you're paid less. Um, so for me, like in terms of like negotiating for different things, Indeed is your best friend um, in terms of what people are paid for your position generally at other organizations, that really helps. Um, but those educational benefits, just bring that up, be honest with them about like where you're going, um, what's next for you and how you think their organization could be part of your journey and how you getting the, these skills could serve their organization's mission. So just a lot of conversations, <laughs> lots of communication right at the front. Thank you so much. That's super helpful advice, Caroline. Thank you. Um, so I see that Emma, you have your hand up. Um, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thanks, Anna. Um, and first off, I guess, thanks to the three of you for taking time out of your week to come and talk to us. Um, my question, I guess, is directed toward Chris, um, but anyone can answer it since I know um, you all have like some sort of background in communications to a degree as well. Um, but to Chris, I was wondering, how do we go about improving the gap between um, academia and scientific research and policy? Um, I had a GIS professor this past semester, and he does research on the spatial distribution of disease. And um, he mentioned that many times research doesn't get shared with policymakers. And, you know, at first thought that doesn't make any sense. But then you think about it a little bit more. And uh, yeah, a lot of the times academia and, you know, any sort of research paper it's not accessible in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of really confusing jargon and a lot of people aren't looking at it from the lens that, you know, you've been doing research on this one thing for the past couple of years. And so it's just inaccessible a lot of the times. So how do we go about improving that gap? Because you would think, you know, that that's information that policymakers really need, but maybe they don't understand it. Um, so how do we just bridge that gap? Yeah, thank you so much for such a thought full question. Um, it sounds like you've had some really interesting course experiences with that too. Um, I, I'll say up front, I don't know if I have the answer. This is a big, um, big social challenge, but I'm happy to think through um, some examples from what I've seen and some thoughts. Um, I think some of the like driving mechanics of this are an incentive misalignment in research where it's sort of uh, um, you get your funding based off of you know sort of folks in your field liking your papers and meeting your milestones for your, your funding agency and so extension and communications becomes sort of one more thing on the to-do list of academics who um, already have 10 million more things than they can do um, so um, Maya's mentioning to me here, I haven't talked yet about, I currently work in academia. I'm a research scientist at the University of Hawaii, among the other things I'm um, juggling. And so I think one, so, so I've seen, I've seen my, my bosses and colleagues, you know, struggle with this. They're up at five and they're still like at 11 and I'm like, how, how do you live? And so I think, I think if you're interested in society, wide like shifting that incentive system to include more outreach and include more sharing across domains there's a couple good opportunities to do that um 
in the legislative sphere. There are some um, internships and fellowships that you can do. I think most of them require maybe a year of experience or so, but you might be able to find a, a, a more entry level one where you can embed in um, lawmaker staffs on the Hill, um, be sort of a science advisor or technical advisor. Um, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy is another huge um, mover in, the, in, in that space. Um, and so you can find um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things in, in Washington where you can try to push the needle on that. Even technical organizations like the um, Association of, of, of Mechanical Engineers, for example, have their little lobbying group in, in Washington. And sometimes those are places you can get involved. Um, but as far as the practical side, I'm, I'm, I, 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 you know, like to try to balance that. I work in academia. I'm going to write a paper. I work in DC. Let's, you know, advise on this giant project. With what are we actually going to do? So, like in my, in my personal life, the ways I've tried to tackle this problem were first at UF. Um, I got some funding actually from the Graham Center um, to to start a a student organization that was uh, dedicated to putting. Um, STEM college students in middle school classrooms in underserved regions of Gainesville. And so I think programs like that are tremendously, can be tremendously impactful and are usually tremendously rewarding ways to um, get involved in the local community. I think participatory research is another angle. How do you make an end product that's actually going to help someone in, in a community that, that you can work with and know about? Um, so if, if, for example, if you're considering a PhD, one thing that my advisor does is all of his projects, even though they're deep R&D, very technical, you know, let's build a robot that swims under the ocean kind of stuff. Um, he doesn't want to do a project that doesn't have some impact on people. So are we going to tend the fisheries that help sustain, you know, the, the um, Hawaiian fishing industry, or are we going to... Um, inspect coral reefs and you know track track their decline and those are things that people care about um and that and that matter to to local communities so um i think a lot of this is really about long-term partnership to wrap it all up like whether it's talking about being in the classroom with students or about choosing your research program when you're trying to design that this is going to be my path to a dissertation or this is going to be my research program as a new academic um, if these things are baked in from the beginning, if the sourcing process and the needs finding process involves community actors and, and groups outside academia, then it's a lot easier to sustain that partnership and that involvement as the program goes on. So how can, how can R&D or how can innovation um, involve policymakers and ideally communities like from the start, I think is, is my biggest takeaway or, or nugget. Um, there. I don't have all the answers, but that's that's where I would start with the problem. <laughs> I can chime in really quick from um, both the policy sides and the science side. So with Commission on Local Debates, so we had four debates in Central Florida in 2020. We actually asked science, you know, environmentally science related questions at every debate. So I think um, engaging on the like the Washington DC federal stuff is really great. Um, but you can also engage on a local level as well and bring science to the, co the conversation that way. Um, and what Chris was speaking to as a researcher, most grants these days require you to write out a section about how you're like, what's your work's purpose? Um, how will it positively impact people? And I think for any of you who want to go into science, I'd recommend considering citizen science. Um, it's like one of the pro one of our um, projects with NASA at SciStarter, there's a project that we've gotten people involved with where they're actually mapping coral reef degradation um, through a computer game. Um, so you can meaningfully engage the public by having them collect or analyze data. And for another one of my projects with science centers and museums, people collect or analyze data about environmental impacts. Then they go through a forum where they make decisions for a fictional town about um, how they would react to what the science is telling them. And then they have a conversation with local leaders. Um, so we did that in Boston on extreme heat. Um, and these local leaders were um, the appointed resiliency officials for um, municipalities in that area. So um, you can go at it from both directions, but I think relationship building is key um, and thinking critically about engaging the public is key too. Yeah, I'll chime in real quick too. Emma, it's really good to see you. Um, and I know that 
the Future of Florida Summit focused on health this year, right? So, I mean, this is a really important niche that we need more people in. So in my job, the whole point of what we do is kind of breaking down science to simpler terms that the general public will understand specifically around vaccines. And I'm still learning every day the best tactics to do this. But yeah, if, if you're looking to get into public service and science, communicating about science, especially with policy is really important. So I definitely encourage looking at places where you can help out with that because it's a huge problem that we need addressed. Thank you all, well, all three of you. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you, Emma, for your question. That's such a neat, you know, interesting and important uh, area to address. So we're nearing the end, but we have one more question from Emily. Um, so Emily, go ahead um, and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm going to make this quick because there is a lot going on at my house, as you can maybe hear in the background there. <laughs> um, so basically, I, this question is for Chris. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your decision to change from the government sector to nonprofit and like your specific experience as a data scientist? I want to know what the differences are there. Um, because I'm looking into going into policy research as a data scientist specifically. And the biggest question for me right now is like, what is the difference between working in different sectors? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Emily. I have a lot of thoughts or at least memories, you know, around this decision. I'm trying to think through it from the perspective of um, comparing one to choose for your career. I think, um, some of the major differences are in um, funding. Um, the federal government tends to, um, over a long time span, you know, implement its its projects at, at scale, whereas academia is is trying to prove prove you know their innovation, right? So it's, it tends to be more pilot scale. So if you're interested in sticking with it through the long term and um, um, becoming an expert on a particular topic and you know trying to push the needle in the direction that you think is right on, on, a, on, a, on a topic that matters to the public, the government can be a great place to do that or think tanks or something government adjacent can be a great place to do that. Um, as a data scientist, you have the benefit of being able to do rigorous statistical analysis on the data and you have the benefit of being able to access insights from data that might be inaccessible to folks without that background. So you can take a giant data file from health and human services like I was in my last job and turn it into a GIS map and say, where is COVID spreading? That's something that you need that skill set or, or, or an adjacent skill set to be able to do that. And so if you're on a topic that's on the government policy radar, you can have a really outsized impact. Um, when I was at state, we were working on the um, COVID-19 data analytics team and our product was being viewed by 50, 60,000 diplomats. Um, and so I was one year out of school. So, you know, you the government has this like massive scale that um, you kind of don't see anywhere else, not even in industry a lot of the times, but academia has a lot more freedom. So to answer the second part of your question, I'll wrap it up quick. I know we're at time. Um, you know, working in the government, you are, as I kind of joked about earlier in my intro, you know, one of something like a million civilian employees of the federal government. Um, you know, I was in a huge data group of 80 people. And so you kind of have to, you know, uh, hue to the program. And the program was probably set by Congress like five years ago. So um, that doesn't mean there's not a place for um, principled dissent or for um, adding your skills and your unique like competency to the, to the program, but it is a little bit more structured than academia. When I switched to academia, um, I went from owning one data source of six data sources into one merge to one dashboard that, you know, in this huge team to 
you know, my advisor saying, what do you want to think about? <laughs> and it's a lot more entrepreneurial in that way. It's like, well, I, I'm curious about biology and natural systems. I want to apply my data science skills to understanding human health at scale through, you know, the smallest scales up to the biggest. Okay, great. I find a problem. <laughs> you know, and so you have a, you have a lot more freedom in academia. And if, if that's something you value, um, you know, sort of being able to go your own way and control your time and uh, publish your results still within the funding priorities that were probably set by our data science friends in the government at some point in the past, um, you know, then academia can be a much more free form and open route. I think they're both really valuable and they complement each other. So if you're interested in policy and data, I mean, you can do that at any major university, you can do that in the government, you can do that in think tanks and Honestly, some of the most uh, um, well-regarded people rotate around through the course of their careers. So you definitely don't have to pick uh, one path now, just whatever appeals to you, whether that's freedom or being part of the big journey or um, trying to influence in the think tank route, if that's, that's your, your thing. Pick what you like, study the topics you like, and you can, you can switch around throughout your career. So in short, please just have fun, all of you. Like, have a nice time, it'll be fun. Thank you for that. So I know we're at time, um, but I did want to ask Mikhail if he wanted to ask this question, but it seems that he just um, disappeared. I think he might've logged off. Or no, there, there he is, Mikhail. Do you want to ask your question? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes, I'm so sorry about that. Um, I wanted to, first off, thank everyone and apologize for being the last one. It's going to take forever. Um, but this question is actually directed to any of you. And I wanted to ask, um, when it comes to founding or initiating a program such as the Florida Community Innovation or the Commission on Local Debates or even the Maya's Uncharted podcast, how do you guys find that gap or that hole uh, for such a program or mission statement in the first place? Well, nobody does it alone. Um, so I think that that's the biggest thing. I think a lot of these ideas come from brainstorming with friends. So like Maya brainstorming with her friend, Sarah, about like what message they want to send into the world. Um, Chris just put talk to the community. That's such a good point. With FCI, we iterate that our, our keynote thing is the Florida resource map. And we kept on iterating it based on user interviews or what we were hearing from our partners at like the United Way of Northwest Florida. Um, and yeah, Chris said, validate the problems you think you have against what the community is telling you. That's such a good point too. So I, I think it's just, um, it always comes about from your partnerships and your collaborations and the things that you all see together. Yeah, and I think the thing for all of us is our hobbies are kind of starting these public service projects. So it's just a fun thing to do, but it's also like something you can share with your professional colleagues that you're doing too. And um, I definitely, I definitely encourage doing that. It sets you apart and it'll, it just great growth for yourself. Like just, you learn so many new skills and everything outside of your work life that you maybe not wouldn't have otherwise. Start it with your friends at the Graham Center. Um, apply to be a student fellow or do one of the Graham Center programs. And then I promise you lots of amazing save the world projects will come your way. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for that, all three of you. Thank you so much for this whole evening and uh, for taking the time again out of your busy schedules, you know, on a Tuesday night to come speak with us. So thank you and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, Marianne just put in the chat um, a little bit earlier that we'll have another program on July 8th and that I'm also looking forward to that. So feel free to RSVP and have a great evening. Thank you again to our panelists. We'll be sending out the recording tomorrow by email and I think their contacts as well. So thank you all. Thank Thanks you all. Anna. Go Gators. Thank you everybody. Gators. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.